Hello and welcome again to another episode of Left to It All. I am your host, C.M. Phillips. Today we will be continuing with the Russia-Ukraine conflict part four. An article from the World Socialist website titled, Who Will Pay for Biden's New Forever War? by Andre Damon on July 1st, 2022. This week, the United States and its NATO allies pledged to increase their true presence in Europe sevenfold in order to prepare for what they called war fighting against nuclear armed peer competitors, that is, war against Russia and China. The NATO members declared that they would increase their high readiness forces from 40,000 to 300,000. Biden announced the U.S. would send another 20,000 troops to Europe amid the escalating war with Russia, accompanied by the permanent deployment of guided missile destroyers and F-35 aircraft. The U.S., which spends more on its armed forces than the next 10 largest militaries combined, yes, the next 10 largest militaries combined, it actually puts the rest of the world to shame, has increased its military spending for six years in a row. Biden's military budget for 2023, already the largest on record, was boosted another 6% by a vote in the Senate Armed Service Committee, bringing the total to $858 billion. And that's just the annual budget, the yearly budget, right? <laughs> uh, let, let, let's say that number again. $858 billion on military. Right? We can't even get baby formula. Uh, people can't pay not only their debt or afford the cost of food and gas, but yeah, let's throw another $858 billion in the military because, you know, freedom or something. Since the start of the Biden administration, the U.S. has pledged over $50 billion in military and economic aid to Ukraine. Ukrainian President Zelensky stated that the country needs at least $60 billion a year in aid to continue its war effort, a figure equivalent to nearly half of Ukraine's pre-war economic output. Last year, when Biden announced the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, he said, We've been a nation too long at war. If you're 20 year old, if you're 20 years old today, you've never known an America at peace. He declared, it's time to end the forever war, apparently by starting World War III. Good for him. Because, you know, the Dems are, they're not the, the war party. Oh, wait, is that the Republicans? Oh, wait, is that the Dems? Oh, wait, is that the Reps? I, I, you know what, I think they're both war parties. Now Biden is committing the American population to a new perpetual war, asserting that there are no limits to the resources that must be devoted to it. Asked Thursday at a news conference at the NATO summit in Madrid to explain what that means to the American people and whether he was pledging indefinite support from the United States for... Uh, from the United States to Ukraine, Biden said, we are going to support Ukraine as long as it takes. Good times, good times. Another reporter asked about the high price of gasoline in the United States and around the world, inquiring, how long? Is it fair to expect American drivers and drivers around the world to pay that premium for this war. Biden reiterated, as long as it takes. So I'm guessing he has no vested interest in this at all. 
No one thought to ask Biden an obvious question. How long will it take? How long will it take? What will be the cost of this open-ended war and what will be the consequences? The United States is spearheading a global conflict that threatens the lives of billions of people and if it develops into a nuclear exchange, the fate of humanity in and of itself. Can anyone imagine, moreover, that a war against Russia, the aim of which is to overthrow the government of the world's largest country, coupled with a war against China, the world's second largest economy, can be achieved without total impoverishing the American population? Of course not. No one asks these questions. That's not how journalism works. You ask the irrelevant questions that no one really gives a flying shit about. You, my, Mr. Biden, I, how you feeling because you have COVID today or something? Or, you know, how's the first lady doing? She she looks she looks nice in that dress she wore the other day or something. Those are the important questions that real hardcore journalists ask nowadays. They don't ask the, the you know these crazy crazy crush questions. These crazy questions of you know the crazy questions of what is this going to fucking do to the world or. Is the global economy going to completely, completely tank, crash, beyond anything we've ever seen since the first Great Depression? I say the first because, ha <laughs> guess what? We're heading, folks. The social and economic consequences of the militarization of society pledged by the U.S. and its allies at the NATO summit are incalculable. In every country's, uh, in every country, government spending on public health and social infrastructure is to be gutted to free up resources for the war effort. This little, you know, little insignificant Nazi-run military regime in Ukraine apparently is the starting point of World War Three. You might be saying, Chris, are you crazy? CM, left to it all, whoever the hell you are, redhead kid with the glasses. Uh... Uh, you, why, why, we're not going to start World War Three in Ukraine. That's ridiculous. Why would why would anyone ever do that? Because just like the First World War and the Second World War, it's profitable. Every war since World War Two that America has fought was a war against socialism. Why? Because it's profitable. Socialism is not pop profitable. If you take care of your own people, you give them health care or something. That's crazy talk. That's nonsense. That's insane. You don't give them health care. You make them work for it. And if they have to work 30 freaking thousand different jobs in order just to attain that insurance that doesn't provide the health care that they need to cover the disease that they have, oh, well, that's just the consequences of a, I don't know, freedom. Ah, <sighs> Good times. Good times. The cost of the war are to be imposed onto the working class through the dismantling of social programs and the demand that workers accept a reduction in real wages in the name of the national interests. Uh, always. The eruption of the war has been accompanied by the total abandonment of any efforts to stop the spread of COVID-19, because, of course, that doesn't exist anymore now that we've, you know, decided it doesn't exist anymore in the media. You know, the government say, hey, you know, just ignore that now. People are still dying all over the place. There's, you know, who gives a shit? It, it, those people don't matter. You know, if they're not going to die from a disease that we most likely created out of a lab in the first fucking place, they're going to die going to war with a country that makes no sense in the first place except for the profit of us. So this is how this works. Don't you understand? It's more important that the rich get richer and the poor die or make us richer. And if they don't make us richer, they go die somewhere. That's what's important. Don't you understand how capitalism works? According to the U.S. government estimates, there will be 100 million new cases of COVID-19 this fall. Oh, that's a fun statistic. More than the number number of all COVID-19 cases previously previously reported to date, and Congress has refused to pass any additional pandemic funding, meaning that 
uninsured people will be forced to pay for COVID-19 vaccines, testing, and treatments out of pocket. Well, there's a big freaking shock there. This week, New York City announced that <coughs> it is slashing public school funding <laughs> by $215 million in what is expected to be a surge in austerity measures around the country. I thought everyone needed to get their kids back to school so that they could learn. But we're, we're just going to slash the budget of schools now. So wait, wait, wait. Wait, I, I don't understand. So everyone was all up in arms because of the pandemic that no one wanted to believe in, apparently. Uh, that, you know, kids had to go back to school. You know, the same school, public school settings, they really weren't teaching them anything to be indoctrinated little good, uh, you know, uh, cogs in the wheel of a system of capitalism that doesn't care about them but exploits them as a system that's the best free system in the world. I don't know. This propaganda machine just keeps churning out bullshit every freaking second of every fucking day. But yes, let's pretend we have to get the kids back to school in a setting where they're often bullied, and now that we have the internet, they can even be bullied at home uh, by going on the internet. But learning really is not the problem, because that's, they're not taught to learn. They're taught to recite some type of thing that they're going to forget two seconds after they're done with a test that means nothing in the first place. They're not taught to learn, so therefore they are not taught. There is no teaching involved. You get a whitewashed history of the world, and you don't get any kind of system in which children are able to think for themselves. All it is is pull this lever because we told you so. You do this and you press this button because we told you so. Remember this date because it's only important to a test because we told you so. That way you can work at McDonald's. Your career is going to take off, I'm telling you. Go to college. Yeah, you're going to have a good time finding a job after that. You know how much debt you have to go in to, to, to get that kind of higher education? Is it worth it? Probably not. For a freaking piece of paper you can hang on your wall that doesn't guarantee a damn thing. Oh, I love our system. I, I love how this is working out for everyone. I think this is what they would call, the elites would call progress. Turning everyone into peasants again. As they rule as kings and gods and yada fucking yada and moving on real quick already the war has fueled demands for slashing entitlement spending nato needs more guns and less butter fuck that means glenn hubbard a former chair of the council of economic advisors wrote <clears throat> in an op-ed in wall street journal earlier this year Demanding cuts in spending on Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. It seems like both parties really kind of want that. It's just the Republicans are a little just a little bit more, you know, they say it a little louder. But in reality, the Democrats want the same thing, too. You know, you, you don't deserve any kind of benefit whatsoever. Just go die somewhere. You know, die, so, die for capitalism. Die so that we can be rich die so we can be rich uh, profiting off of some more. It's good times for all. Spending offsets to accommodate higher defense spending would surely require slowing the growth in social insurance spending, he wrote. While out-of-control military spending against the backdrop of decades of Wall Street bailouts has contributed to the inflationary crisis, the U.S. political establishment is seeking to impose the full burden of the crisis on the working class. The Federal Reserve has initiated a program of seeking to deliberately increase unemployment by raising interest rates, hoping to restore balance to the labor market by throwing hundreds of thousands of people out of work. By the way, there's a, a shitload of other different ways we can do this. 
you know, the Fed just upping interest rates is only going to have an immediate effect, a destabilizing effect on the economy, but even more so, uh, an incredibly uh, egregious effect on the majority of the working class. It has, it's not going to do shit, really. It's just, it's a spiral downhill. It's shit rolling downhill. The, you know, the, the rich aren't going to suffer from those inst- interest rates hikes. And because they just give it, they, they pass the buck on. Whether, we're, whether it's to the, in, the laborers, the workers, or the consumers, the people at the top, they're not going to lose a dollar. They're not going to lose uh, $10 million. They're going to probably gain, I don't know how many hundreds of millions of dollars. That's how the system works. That's what you should know. It's important. Capitalism sucks. The intensification of the war will likely place <clears throat> will likely take place against the tidal wave of layoffs beginning in the technological and real estate sector and spreading throughout the auto the auto industry. According to one tracker, there were 26,000 layoffs in the technology sector alone last month, up from 20,000 the month before. So another 6,000. The global war being initiated by the Biden administration, and it is a global war. This is not just Ukraine. This is not just Russia. This is against Russia and China, most likely Iran, and the partnership of BRICS, which is also uh, for some reason right now, Brazil, but if Lula gets back into power, it'd make a hell of a lot more sense than Bolsonaro, the president, who's basically the uh, Brazilian version of Trump, uh, who's most likely going to be ousted. Uh, another whole story all there together. Uh, South Africa, which is also part of the BRICS system in India. So, if you've never heard of a unipolar world, the American empire runs the world. It runs the global economic system, which is called capitalism, right? It tells other countries what they can and cannot do, okay? They borrow from American American economic institutions like the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, or the World Bank. These are both the United States-owned institutions that were created during the Bretton Woods system after World War II. We own the world. Now the empire is declining. People in other countries are like, this is insane. We don't, this is, no, enough of this. And they're trying to create what's called a multipolar world. A multipolar economic world, uh, uh, economic system. A multipolar economic system in which one country and their cronies, their allies like NATO, don't rule the entire economic system globally or the economic hegemony. So it's splitting. That split is a threat to the U.S. empire. So they're going to fight like hell to make sure Russia and China, Iran, India, South Africa, Brazil, and any other country, Venezuela, who knows, any, any country that pisses them off in even the slightest way, we'll call a dictator, even though they're actually probably not a dictator at all, or authoritarian at all, they're actually trying to do what's best for their own population, which is a danger, because bringing democracy to their people is what we in the United States and the ruling elites call dictatorships, authoritarianism, yada, yada, yada. It is Orwell's 1984. Remember, 1984. War is peace. You know, that kind of shit. That kind of linguistics where you switch the interpretation. You take a word that means one thing and you switch it to mean something completely the opposite of its true meaning and definition. War is peace. It's like saying, it's like, starvation is being full or something. All right, I got to keep going because there's two other articles I got to get into here. So again, the global war initiated by the Biden administration 
is at one and the same time a war against the working class of the United States. Through war, the U.S. ruling class is seeking to at once divert internal tensions outward through the creation of an external enemy and build up the forces of repression to crush strikes and social struggles. In other words, the people in this country are bullshit. They're tired of being exploited. They're tying, tired of being screwed. They know they're being screwed by both damn parties and they're tired of it all. They want, they could, they could give a shit about the entire government. None of the government officials, none of these flying politicians work for them. They, 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 we know that people are getting that. They're starting to wake up to it, and they're saying enough is enough. So they, the government and the ruling elites, have to distract us. War with China, war with Iran, war with Russia, war with Ukraine, war in Syria. I don't know. Let, war with aliens, whatever it takes to distract people and whip up some kind of nationalistic fervor into doing what they want you to do, which is not focus on the actual problems that you are facing every single day, but the problems of something that is in some far distant land that has nothing to do to you, with you and that is not going to solve one ounce of any of your problems that your own government and the corporations and the ruling elite are forcing down your throats every single day. Biden's commitment to unlimited American involvement in the war with Russia enjoys the support of the entire U.S. political establishment. I pretty much just said that. The outcome of NATO, the NATO summit was hailed by the editorial boards of the U of the major U.S. newspapers, as a big surprise, uh, from democratically uh, democratic aligned New York Times and Washington Post to the Republic aligned Wall Street Journal. Quote: Whatever happens in President Biden's tenure, no matter how long that tenure lasts, no matter uh, the events this week in Europe will ensure that the presidency is a consequential one, the Post proclaimed. Consequential in destroying the majority of the lives of the American working class. Yeah, it's pretty consequential there. Not a single <coughs> Democratic member of Congress has criticized Biden's pledge of endless resources for the war effort. Notice we still don't have health care, but, you know, hey, can't afford it. We have to just give Ukraine billions of dollars constantly. Despite the unending barrage of propaganda aimed at exciting the public hatred of Russia and China, the war in Ukraine is broadly unpopular. In a YouGov poll published this week, 40% of respondents said the U.S. should be less militarily engaged in conflicts around the world compared with 12% who said it should be more engaged. Yeah, Those are people who uh, we shouldn't have anywhere near any seat in any type of government or any institution that creates policy whatsoever. Those 12% of people, they can move to Ukraine. That's where they can go. They want freedom and democracy. That's where they think it is. You know, they can move to Ukraine. Those 12%. Bye-bye. Have fun. Asked what Biden's top priority should be, 38% said the White House should seek to address the surging costs of living compared with 8% who said the U.S. should ensure a defeat of Russia in Ukraine. So, 38% said the White House should seek to address the surging cost of living in the United States compared with 8% who said the U.S. should ensure a defeat of Russia in Ukraine. Those 8% people also should go go to Ukraine and, and, and pick up arms and go fight f with the Nazis because, you know, that's where they belong. They shouldn't be policy makers, okay? Either they get a quick slap of reality and education and history and wake the fuck up 
or they can go and move to Ukraine. They love it so much there, go! I want to save this country, not destroy it. I want to save this world, not destroy it. You align with Nazis, then you're a fucking Nazi. Big fucking period at the end of that statement. 46% of respondents said they oppose the United States military becoming directly involved in combat in the Russia-Ukraine war compared to just 23% who support such a move. Because, you know, we're going to get so much from doing this. The American population has not forgotten the crimes carried out by American imperialism against the people of Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, Still going on, by the way, in Syria. Still a proxy war with Russia and Syria. Syria, uh, Yemen, who were just sending Saudi Arabia and you know plenty of arms to destroy Yemen altogether, in a the world's one of the world's worst humanitarian crises, for some reason that no American seems to even understand. What's a Yemen? Yeah, just just ignore it. Just keep. Send the bombs and, you know, I mean, Saudi Arabia is a great democracy. Oh, wait, no, it's a monarchy and it's supported the, the majority of the terrorists who actually caused 9-11. But, you know, that's, no no one cares about that stuff anymore. It's, they're good people now. They have oil. And dozens of other countries subjected to U.S. Destabil destabilization campaigns, proxy wars, and murderous economic sanctions. There does not, outside of the International Committee of the Fourth International, exist any organized political opposition to the war plans of, the United, of U.S. imperialism. The social basis for the building of a new anti-war movement is the working class. Just as imperialist war abroad is at the same time a war on the working class at home, so too the fight against the war against war is at the same time a fight of the working class against inequality, exploitation, and the capitalist profit system. Here's where it starts to get real. In a multipolarista.com article by Ben Norton titled, NATO seeks to prevent Eurasian challenger to the U to U.S. world dominance, admits ex-CIA chief Mike Pompeo. Yeah, this is fun. Neoconservative former CIA director, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo admitted that the NATO cartel seeks to prevent the formation of a pan-Eurasian uh, Pan-Eurasian colossus that would challenge Washington's empire. The United States must remain the dominant force in the world and for an awfully long time to come, he insisted. Pompeo made it clear that the new Cold War between the U.S., EU, NATO bloc on the one side and the Eurasian bloc led by China and Russia on the other is a battle over economic hegemony and is rooted in control of fossil fuels and other resources. Quote, We must prevent the formation of a pan-Eurasian colossus incorporating Russia, but led by China, Pompeo employed. To do that, we have to strengthen NATO, and we see that nothing hinders Finland and Sweden's entry into that organization. The former CIA and State Department chief said this in an extremely hawkish speech on June 24th, titled War Ukraine and a Global Alliance for Freedom. <laughs> uh. So oh well, and it's, it, it makes me want to vomit in my mouth a little. Maybe I'll do it a little later, but I want to try to get through most of the article first. Pompeo delivered the bellicose remarks at the Hudson Institute, a neoconservative Washington-based think tank, where he serves as a distinguished fellow. 
Pompeo should not be distinguished as anything more than a fucking fascist and should be kicked in the ass every morning and every night because of it. Moving on. Just Okay, just moving on. I could add, but just moving on. In addition to receiving funding from the Pentagon, the Hudson Institute is financed by large corporations such as Axon Mobil and billionaire oligarchs like the Kochs and the Walton family. If you don't know who the Kochs are, well, the, the Koch brothers, one died, but yeah, ultra-conservative assholes, and the Walton family, you know, ultra-conservative assholes who run Walmart. Pompeo's insistence that NATO must dedicate itself to destroying any alternatives to the, excuse me, to U.S. Uni unipolar hegemony exposed the hollowness of claims that the U.S.-led military alliance is defensive. It's not. It's offensive. We're doing everything we can. It's a war department. We don't have a department of defense. That is another Orwellian term. It is the department of war. NATO's professed commitment to human rights and democracy is also clearly contradicted by the fact that one of its uh, one of its founding members in 1949 was the fascist dictatorship of Portugal. In 2019, Pompeo quipped, I was the CIA director. We lied. We cheated. We stole. We had entire training courses. I don't know what it takes for people to understand. They, they, they don't lie about They don't even have to hide it anymore. They just say it. This is people don't know anything about it. In his latest speech to the Hudson Institute this, uh, this June, Pompeo mapped out a hardline U.S. strategy for the new Cold War against both Russia and China. Pompeo, U.S. Uh, U.S must remain the dominant force in the world. Pompeo condemned the Joe Biden administration for ending the U.S. military occupation of Afghanistan in 2021 after 20 years of war. Because 20 years just isn't long enough. Uh, he argued that America's undisciplined withdrawal from Afghanistan was interpreted by Vladimir Putin as a green light and had weakened Washington's hegemony. Remember, we did everything we could when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan to turn Afghanistan for the Soviet Union into what was our Vietnam. We lost in Vietnam. In fact, we didn't win a war since the end of World War II, and it's questionable whether we even won World War II, because if not for the Soviet Union, I doubt we would have. Uh, yeah, we don't... A lot of problems here. So, he said that this was a green light for Vladimir Putin to try to shore up its borders as NATO expansion continues to threaten Russians' borders. All right, sure. Yeah, it's a green light. All of a sudden, they felt, felt emboldened to do something that they knew could be possibly suicidal, considering the United States government and everything within NATO, our allies and all the dictators and brutal fascistic assholes that we support, including ourselves. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Putin, who's kind of a dirtbag himself, probably said, no, this isn't a green light so much as it is a red line. We can't allow Georgia, nor can we allow Ukraine to be part of NATO. You keep expanding. We keep saying, don't do that. You don't listen. And we have to eventually put our foot down on the ground and say enough. That's just my wild interpretation of it, but According to Pompeo, Pompeo made no effort to hide his goal. Continued the U.S. imperial domination of the planet without any challengers. In America, we live in the greatest nation in the history of civilization, he claimed. 
we are not in decline, but rather we are a nation that will be a ascendant. Oh, I love that word. We will be a nation that will be ascendant and we will be the dominant force in the world and a force for good in the world as we have been for the last decades for an awfully long time to come. You can bank on it. I can literally come up with an entire one hour show to disprove that entire sentence. I'm sorry, it'll probably be another five part episode. It's just insanity. Confront the Chinese Communist Party and contain the Russian Chinese access. Yeah. All right, Pompeo, you're you're a great guy. In order to maintain U.S. dominance, Pompeo forcefully detailed how the United States is waging a new Cold War to contain the Russian Chinese access. As Secretary of State under former President Donald Trump, I traveled the world, alerting the world to the threat from the Chinese Communist Party. Kind of reminds me of Nixon. So he explained. <laughs> China stated, "Intent is to displace the United States as the world's preeminent power." Pompeo claimed. We must not ever allow the communist model for development to proliferate, he stated. In terms of China's economy, Pompeo state, said, we should force them to become more like us. Which is kind of funny because it took us a hell of a lot longer to develop than it did for China, which was a very backwards, undeveloped country, to already surpass us once and for the most part will most likely surpass us within just maybe a couple of years at this point. He stressed that Washington must do its global leadership role in confronting the Chinese Communist Party. By the way, it's a Chinese Communist Party, but it's not a communist country. And there's a significant difference. Okay? China's a capitalist country with... Chinese characteristics that is somewhat socialism because they balance their economy you know so they make room for all different things that work for not only their country but expanding uh, their economy and helping other countries that we in the United States and, and NATO allies try to destroy Pompeo's singular obsession with the kneecapping of China extended beyond the country's government to, China, to the Chinese people. Using xenophobic rhetoric, he warned that the Chinese communists are inside the gates. Fucking gates he's talking about. Echoing bigoted anti-Semitic tropes, Pompeo warned of the Chinese problem, claiming they have their teeth into America. They attend our school board meetings. They attend our county commission meetings. Uh, they they pee in the same toilets we use in America. No, I'm just... <coughs> he even complained that there were uh, 360,000 Chinese students pre-COVID studying in the United States of America. I didn't, I didn't, what? We have people from other countries coming over here to learn? <laughs> I wonder how many American students traveled to China to learn. Oh, that's right. That's why we're failing. just decimate our school and learning uh, institutions. <laughs> we, we have a good amount of Americans going over to Cuba in order to get uh, uh, doctorates, in order to become doctors, and then coming back here uh, because they get free education in that small, tiny island nation called Cuba. You know? We, America, the largest economy on earth, we can't afford to give free education to our people or free health care. But Cuba can. You know, that little tiny little tiny island just off the coast of Florida? Yeah, they, they, that's what they do. They can give their people free education and free health care. And anyone who actually goes 
into Cuba. They can do that, but we can't. The largest empire, the largest and most wealthy empire nation in the history of the earth. But where's the money going to come from to... to, to, to Expanding Quarante China alliance by adding South Korea, Britain, France, Pompeo argued there is a necessity of forming a new global alliance of freedom. I don't know what conservatives even mean by that term anymore. Freedom and liberty. I don't think they have the faintest clue of what that even is. Which has to contest, which must contest both Russian and Chinese aggression, which means American aggression against Russia and China. That's the reality. Uh, to this end, he called the expanding of quadru uh, quadrilateral uh, security dialogue, or quad, uh, the anti-China alliance between the United States, Japan, India, and Australia. Pompeo said South Korea, Britain, and France should be added to the quad. He also argued that the uh, AUKU S, military pact between the U.S., U.K., the, and Australia should be folded into this expanding security alliance aimed at countering China. Using Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan as U.S. bases of power to wage this new Cold War on both China and Russia, Pompeo argued the United States should be, um, should, I'm sorry, the, uh, to wage this new Cold War on both China and Russia, Pompeo argued the U.S. should base its geopolitical strategy on what he called the three lighthouses for liberty. <laughs> Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. Well, I don't know, maybe Taiwan to some degree, but I, again, I could have several episodes on just how insanely fascistic Israel and Ukraine are, so he proposed that linking these <clears throat> three bastions with NATO. Blah! That's what I think about that. As well as the new and expanded security framework for the Indo-Pacific will form a global alliance for freedom. Because when you can't say tyrannical, authoritarian, dictatorship, fascist, and all the wonderful terms they really mean, you just say freedom. By adding Ukraine, we, undermi we undermine the creation of a Russia-Chinese axis bent on ex ex exterting, exter exter okay. exterting military and economic hegemony in Europe, in Asia, and in the Middle East, he said. Pompeo boasted th that the Trump administration did not hesitate in supplying Ukraine with weapons such as the Javelin. They, we love to arm Nazis. He also gloated that pro the proxy war in Ukraine, yeah, and it is a proxy war, is a warning to China over Taiwan. Pompeo openly called for supporting separatism in Taiwan, declaring, It is my steadfast view that our government should immediately confer diplomatic recognition to Taiwan, for it is a free and sovereign country allowing Taiwan to remain as part of China would severely reduce, Ameri reduce American influence in the Indo-Pacific. America's status as a superpower would be placed in jeopardy, he argued. Washington must maintain influence over Taiwan, Pompeo went on, because it is a primary technological and economic partner of the United States and the principal supplier of high-end semiconductors to the United States economy. Fossil fuels central to geopolitics, U.S. remain, uh, must re regain our energy uh, dominance. At the heart of the U.S. Cold War on China and Russia is a struggle for control over resources. Mike Pompeo stressed, It is my conviction that America and the West must acknowledge the centrality of hydrocarbon energy 
to the world's geopolitics, he said. He insisted that the United States must regain our energy dominance. Energy and economy security, along with military strength, are the pillars upon which geostrategic power and peace rests, he added. The former CIA and State Department chief warned that if NATO doesn't stop Moscow, Russia will become a juggernaut dominating fossil fuels. Invoking Ronald Reagan, Michael Pom uh, Pompeo described the former Soviet Union as the evil empire. He insisted that NATO must prevent Russia's reconstruction of the Soviet empire. I don't, these are just insane talking points that if any American actually still believes, if you watch mainstream media and think Putin is anything but a capitalist trying to assure his own border, you, he's not a Soviet, he's not a socialist, he's not a communist, he's a fucking capitalist. There ain't no social uh, Soviet empire, rather. There's none. It's not going to be rebuilt. He don't want to rebuild it. It's absurd. But I digress. Let's just, let's repeat it. He insisted that NATO must prevent Russia's reconstitution of the Soviet Empire because it, if rebuilt, even in small measure, could make a joke there, if rebuilt even in small measure, would dictate world fossil fuel supplies causing massive, massive economic hemorrhaging in America and throughout the globe affecting every single American. Uh, like it's not already affecting every single American now because of what you and your globalist capitalist class of exploitative assholes are doing with the market as we speak. There's not an inflation simply because, you know, the war in Ukraine or the pandemic. No, corporations just hike the freaking profit. They hike the prices so that they can make more money. That's how capitalism works. That's capitalism 101. When they see an opportunity to hike up the price, they're going to do it. And then they'll just blame their employees for wanting more money or something. It's bullshit. It's a Ponzi scheme. That's what capitalism is. Peace talks are dead, are a dead end. Ukraine must win war <laughs> against Russia. Yeah, good luck with that. Pompeo transparently described the conflict in Ukraine as a proxy war, arguing, arguing it serves U.S. interests because it weakens Russia while U.S. soldiers don't have to put their lives on the line. No, they don't. The American people are just going to have to starve. He condemned the idea of peace talks, maintaining <laughs> America and the nations of the world cannot continue the pretense that the war in Ukraine can end in a negotiated peace which mollifies Russia for such a peace cannot be negotiated with Vladimir Putin. Ukraine must win this war. It must win this war decisively. In other words, America is absolutely willing. And this is Pompeo. Remember, under the Trump administration, that jackass, remember? Okay, this isn't the Biden administration, the so-called Democrats. There's no real difference between them. The Democrats are fascists, but they're just a little bit nicer and in their bigotry and they say they're you know all inclusive in this identity politics bullshit it, the real politics folks has always been and always should be first and foremost class politics class war you have no freedom if we do not win the class war and the Republicans sure as hell are not the anti-war party. If you fucking think that that was true, then all you have to do is look at Afghanistan, Iran. I mean, seriously, 
They're both war parties. They're both both capitalist parties, and they both could give a fuck about the majority of us. We're cannon fodder, just like the Ukrainian people are cannon fodder against a proxy war with Russia. They can all die. We're perfectly fine with it. Reality kind of sucks, huh? The war can be won, he claims. This war can be won if America and our allies supply a range of our most capable conventional weapons to Kiev. Yeah, Kiev. Not Kiev. 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 Pompeo called for providing Ukraine a surface-to-air missile system that engaged both aircraft and missiles. Yeah, that, that'll go over well. He also heaped praise on Ukrainian leader Vladimir Zelensky, liking him to George Washington for some fucking reason. <coughs> Pompeo was clear that Ukraine should be added to NATO, claiming it is silly that it would cross Russia's security red lines. I'm not worried about escalation, he said. No, why would he be? He wants World War Three. He don't give a flying shit. The elites believe somehow they'll just all aboard a fucking rocket ship to Mars and, and somehow get away from the nuclear the disaster that they create. Guess what? The majority of us, they, we won't be invited on that same rocket ship. Or any rocket ship for that matter. <laughs> yeah, it's fucking crazy. All right, Pompeo proudly. Uh, this is getting sickening, so hopefully this wraps up soon. Uh, Bom P Pompeo proudly created the, uh, the U.S. government for overthrowing the Soviet Union, which we did, in a bipartisan anti-communist crusade during the first Cold War. Nine, count them. Nine American presidents from each of our political parties. Yes, both Democrat and Republican. Uh, nine American presidents dismembered the Soviet Empire at enormous great cost, he said. To allow it to even begin to reconstitute is unthinkable. None of this, uh, well, that was pretty much true, but to, to reconstitute, to, it makes no sense. They're not trying to. Well, much of his speech was devoted to how the American, uh, how the United States is a force for freedom, democracy, and human rights. Pompeo also insisted that Washington str should strengthen its alliance with the dictatorial absolute monarchy in Saudi Arabia, one of our great allies, good friends, and uh, the people who actually caused 9-11. In the name of countering the Iranian regime, uh, which he described as a kind of biblical evil. I don't think there were, if there were, there weren't many. I believe it was, what, like 15 out of 19 of the uh, terrorist hijackers on 9-11 were Saudi Arabian nationals. I can't remember who the other ones were, I forgot. I looked it up a little back, uh, a little while back, but I just can't remember. I don't believe any one of them were Iranian. But if I'm wrong, you know, there's a comment section. If YouTube allows you to comment on my stuff, I don't know anymore who the most. All right, from the Chris Hedges report. NATO, the most dangerous military alliance on the planet. The massive expansion of NATO, not only in Eastern and Central Europe, but the Middle East, Latin America, Africa, Asia, and presages endless war and a potential nuclear holocaust. So he's starting off op optimistic. I'm just kidding. I love Chris Hedges. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, and the arms industry that depends on it for billions in profits has become the most aggressive and dangerous military alliance on the planet. Created in 1949 to thwart Soviet expansion into Eastern and Central Europe. It has evolved into a global war machine in Europe, the Middle East, Latin America, Africa, and Asia. NATO expanded its footprint, violating promises to Moscow once the Cold War ended to incorporate 14 countries in Eastern and Central Europe into the alliance. It soon added Finland and Sweden. It bombed Bosnia, Serbia, and Kosovo. It launched wars in Afghanistan, 
Iraq, Syria, and Libya, resulting in close to a million deaths and some 38 million people driven from their homes. It is building a military footprint in Africa and Asia. It invited Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and South Korea, the so-called Asian Asia Pacific Four, to its recent summit in Madrid at the end of June. It has expanded its reach to the Southern Hemisphere, signing a military training partnership agreement with Colombia in December of 2021. It has backed Turkey with NATO's second largest military, which has illegally invaded and occupied parts of Syria as well as Iraq. Turkish-backed militias are engaged in ethnic cleansing of uh, Syrian, Kurds, and other inhabitants of North and East Syria. The Turkish military has been accused of war crimes, including multiple airstrikes against a refugee camp and chemical weapons use in northern Iraq. In exchange for President uh, Erdogan's permission for Finland and Sweden to join the alliance, the two Nordic countries have agreed to expand their domestic terror laws, making it easier to crack down on Kurdish and other activists, lift their restrictions on selling arms to Turkey, and deny support to the Kurdish-led movement for democratic autonomy in Syria. It is quite a record for the military alliance that with the collapse of the Soviet Union was rendered obsolete and should have been dismantled. NATO and the militarists have no intentions of embracing the peace dividend, fostering a world based on diplomacy. A re respect of spheres of influence and mutual cooperation. It was determined to stay in business. It's business is war. That meant expanding its war machine far beyond the border of Europe and engaging in ceaseless antagonism toward Russia and China. NATO sees the future as detailed in its NATO 2030 unified for a new era as a battle for hegemony with rival states, especially China, and calls for the, the preparation of prolonged global conflict. Quote, China has an increasingly global strategic agenda supported by its economic and military heft. The NATO 2030 initiative warned, it has proven its willingness to use force against its neighbors as well as economic coercion and intimidatory di uh, diplomacy <coughs> well beyond the Indo-Pacific region. Over the coming decade, China will likely also challenge NATO's ability to build a collective, resilient, safeguard, critical infrastructure addressing. Uh, uh, infrastructure address new and emerging technologies such as 5G and protect sensitive sectors of the economy including supply change, chains. Long term, China is increasingly likely to project military power globally including potentially the Euro-Atlantic area." End quote. The alliance has spurned, spurned the Cold War strategy that made sure Washington was closer to Moscow and Beijing than Moscow and Beijing were to each other. U.S. and NATO antagonism has, have turned Russia and China into close allies. Russia, rich in natural, natural resources, including energy, minerals, and grains, and China, a manufacturing and technological behemoth, are a potent combination. NATO no longer distinguishes between the two, announcing in its most recent mission statement that 
the deepening strategic partnership between Russian and China has resulted in mutually reinforcing attempts to undercut the rules-based international order that run counter to our values and interests. On July 6th, Christopher Wray, director of the FBI, and Ken McCallum, director general of Britain's MI5, held a joint news conference in London to announce that China was the biggest long-term threat to our economic and national security. They accused China, like Russia, of interfering in the U.S. and U.K. elections. Ray warned the business leaders they addressed that the Chinese government was set on stealing your technology, whatever it is that makes your industry tick, and using it to undercut your businesses and dominate your market. This inflammatory rhetoric passages uh, presages an ominous future. One cannot talk about war without talking about markets, the political and social turmoil in the United States coupled with its diminishing economic power has led it to embrace NATO and its war machine as the antidote to its decline. Washington and its European allies are terrified of China's trillion dollar Belt and Road Initiative meant to connect an economic block of roughly 70 nations outside U.S. control. The initiative includes the construction of rail lines, roads, and gas pipelines that will be integrated with Russia. Beijing is expected to commit $1.3 trillion to the Belt and Road Initiative by 2027. China, which is on track to become the world's largest economy within a decade, has organized the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, the world's largest trade pack of 15 East Asian and Pacific nations representing 30% of global trade. It already accounts for 28.7% of the global manufacturing output, nearly double to 16.8% of the U.S. 28.7% compared to 16.8% of the U.S. China's rate of growth last year was an impressive 8.1%, although slowing around 5% this year. By contrast, the U.S.'s growth rate in 2021 was 5.7%, its highest since 1984, 1984, but is predicted to fall below 1% this year by the New York Federal Reserve. If China, Russia, Iran, India, and other nations free themselves from the tyranny of the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency, and the International Society for the World for wor for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunications or SWIFT, a messaging network financial institutions used to send and receive information such as money transfer instructions, it will trigger a dramatic decline in the value of the dollar and a financial collapse in the US. The huge military expenditures which have driven the United States debt to thirty trillion, six trillion more than the US entire GDP gross domestic product will become untenable. Well um, untenable. <sighs> Servicing this debt costs thirty billion a year. We spend more on military and twenty uh, on the military in 2021, uh, 801 billion. 
All right, let me say that again. Servicing this debt costs thir 300. Did I say that right? Servicing this debt costs 300 billion a year. We spend more on the military in on the military in 2021 801 billion which amounted to 38% of total world expenditure on the military than the next nine countries including China and Russia combined. The loss of the dollar as the world's reserve currency will force the U.S. to slash spending, shuttering many of its 800 plus military bases overseas and cope with the inevitable social and political upheavals triggered by economic collapse. It is darkly ironic that NATO has accelerated this possibility. Russia, in the eyes of NATO and the U.S. strategists, is the appetizer. Its military, NATO hopes, will get bogged down and degraded in Ukraine. Sanctions and diplomatic isolation, the plan goes, will, thus, will thrust Vladimir Putin from power, a client regime that will do U.S. bidding, will be installed in Moscow. Unlikely. NATO has proved more, provided more than eight billion in military aid to Ukraine, while the U.S. has committed nearly fifty-four billion in military and humanitarian. I love that one. Love that word. Humanitarian assistance to the country. China, however, is the main course. Russia's the appetizer. China's the main course. Unable to complete, uh, uh, compete economically, the United States and NATO have turned to the blunt instrument of war to cripple their global competitor. The provocation of China replicates the NATO baiting of Russia. NATO expansion and the 2014 U.S.-backed coup in Kiev led Russia to first occupy Crimea in eastern Ukraine with its large ethnic Russian population and then to invade all of Ukraine to thwart the country's efforts to join NATO. The same dance of death is being played with China over Taiwan, which China considers part of Chinese territory and with NATO expansion in the Asian Pacific China flies warplanes into Taiwan's airspace, Taiwan's air defense zone, and the United States sends naval ships through the Taiwan Strait, which connects the South and the East China Seas. This is not part of the United States. This is not an influence of NATO. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization has nothing to do with the Pacific the further NATO expands the less really it has any cre credibility uh, since the end or the fall or the dissolution of the Soviet Union NATO has no authority or justification for existing whatsoever Secretary of State Anthony Blinken in May called China the most serious long-term challenge to the international order, citing its claims to Taiwan, which is part of China, and efforts to dominate the South China Sea. Taiwan's president, in a Zelensky-like pub publicity stunt, recently posed with an anti-tank rocket launcher and a government handout photo. The conflict in Ukraine has been a bonanza for the arms industry, which, given the humiliating withdrawal from Afghanistan, needed a new conflict. Lockheed Martin stock prices are up 12%. Northrop Grumman is up 20%. 
The war is being used by NATO to increase its military presence in Eastern and Central Europe. The U.S. is building a permanent military base in Poland. The 40,000-strong NATO reaction force is being expanded to 300,000 troops. Billions of dollars in weapons are pouring into the region. The conflict with Russia, however, is already backfiring. The ruble has soared to a seven-year high against the dollar. Europe is barreling towards a recession because of rising oil and gas prices and the fear that, the, that Russia could terminate supplies completely. The loss of Russian wheat, fertilizer, gas, and oil due to Western sanctions is creating havoc in the world markets and a humanitarian crisis in Africa and the Middle East, soaring food and energy prices along with shortages and crippling inflation, bringing them not only deprivation and hunger, but social upheaval and political instability. The climate emergency, the real existential threat, is being ignored to appease the gods of war. The war makers are frighteningly cavalier about the threat of nuclear war. Putin warns NATO countries that they will face consequences greater than any you have faced in history if they intervene directly in Ukraine and ordered Russian nuclear forces to be put on heightened alert status. The proximity to Russia of U.S. nuclear weapons based in Belgium, Germany, Italy, Netherlands, and Turkey mean that any nuclear conflict would obliterate much of Europe. Russia and the United States control 90% of the world's nuclear warheads with around 4,000 warheads each in their military stockpiles, according to the Federation of American Scientists. President Joe Biden warned that the use of nuclear weapons in Ukraine would be completely unacceptable and entail severe consequences. Without spelling out what those consequences would be, this is what U.S. strategists refer to as deliberate ambiguity. The U.S. military follow its fiascos in the Middle East has shifted its focus from frightening, fighting terrorism as asymmetrical warfare to confronting China and Russia. President Barack Obama's national security team in 2016 carried out a war game in which Russia invaded a NATO country in the Baltics and used a low-yield uh, low tact tactical nuclear weapon against NATO forces. Obama officials were split about how to respond. The National Security Council so-called Principles Committee included including cabinet officers and members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, decided that the United States had no choice but to retaliate with nuclear weapons. Eric Schulzer writes in The Atlantic, any other type of response, the committee argued, would show a lack of resolve, damage American credibility, and weaken the NATO alliance. Choosing a suitable nuclear target proved difficult, however. Hitting Russia's invading force would kill innocent civilians in a NATO country. Striking targets inside Russia might escalate the conflict to an all-out nuclear war. In the end, the NSC Principles Committee recommended a nuclear attack on Belarus, a nation that had played no role whatsoever in the invasion of the NATO ally, but had the misfortune of being a Russian ally. The Biden administration has formed a tiger team of national security officials to run war games 
on what to do if Russia uses a nuclear weapon, according to the New York Times. The threat of nuclear war is minimized with discussions of tact tactical nuclear weapons, as if less powerful nuclear explosions are somehow more acceptable and won't lead to the use of bigger bombs. At no time, including the Cuban Missile Crisis, have we stood closer to the precipice of nuclear war. A, simul a, simul a simulation devised by experts at Princeton University starts with Moscow firing a nuclear warning shot. NATO responds with a small strike. And the ensuing war yields more than 90 million casualties in its first few hours, the New York Times responded. The longer the war in Ukraine continues, and the U.S. and NATO seem determined to funnel billions of dollars of weapons into the conflict for months, if not years, the more the unthinkable becomes thinkable, flirting with Armageddon to profit the arms industry and carry out the futile quest to reclaim U.S. global hegemony is at best extremely reckless and at worst genocidal. Thank you for watching part four on Ukraine. If you like this content, which I can't imagine you would, because I don't even like this content. I'm scared to fucking death. But if you like my content, my analysis, the articles that I read and take to heart, please like and subscribe. Thank you for watching.